We're looking for another talk. We are. And I should switch slides so you know who's coming up. I know who's it? coming Here up. Here it is. It's uh, the one and only. The one and only, the great Robert Lemke is here to grace us again with his wis wisdom. Um, he's going to tell us more things. Um, and uh, so but before we introduce, before we can properly introduce our speakers, we asked them to give us like this one little thing of information that we didn't know about them beforehand. And um, for Robert Lemke, this was obviously hard because a lot of you people have known him for a long time. But he pulled out a great piece of trivia, which is that uh, long before his developing days, he had a job where he would sit in the rafters at um, venues and throw confetti and glitter at bands. Which I think is really on, cool. Uh, for like a TV show. <laughs> and I can just I love the mental image of Robert sitting in the rafters like a little monkey and just throwing hands full <laughs> of glitter. How beautiful is that? Did you know that? We didn't. And if I think back to the you know pictures I saw of Robert with uh, when he was younger, um, you know, with his hair all different, and then ah, it's, it's it's beautiful. Yeah, it's a beautiful image. Thank you for sharing. Next time he's on stage, we will confront him with that memory. Maybe we can find <laughs> some biodegradable glitter to throw at him. Well, that's that's a nice idea. Can somebody jot that down? <laughs> we need that as a permanent idea. Thank you. <laughs> All right, but now to the more technical side of things. Um, Robert wants to tell us about more complex scenarios that they have been implementing and how to elegantly solve problems. Um, we will be hearing about Open ID Connect with Neos and Flow. So take it away, Robert, and we'll hopefully be talking to you right after. Enjoy Robert's talk. Yeah, so welcome to my talk about OpenMicD Connect uh, from my home sweet home office in this unusual in situ situation. Um, I'm Robert, um, I'm managing partner at Flow Native and uh, the NEOS project founder some years ago. And uh, one of my pet topics this year, beginning of this year, has been OpenID Connect and authentication in general. So I want to talk a bit about that. And what I plan to do is showing you some theory at first, uh, but then mostly going into a demo um, based on the NEOS demo website and see how we can integrate OpenID Connect with a plugin I created. Right, so let's just dive in. Um, Authentication and something which has to do with users and passwords. Uh, this is OpenID Connect about, uh, is what it's about. And uh, just to illustrate some, some of the goals you might have um, illustrating this, this login screen here, for example. So one thing you might want to have is some centralized user management. Um, so you you might have uh, several applications um, you want to provide for users, and they shouldn't be able to uh, they sh they shouldn't have to log in again and again or use different passwords. Or you want to control centrally uh, which applications they have access to or which roles they have there, um, and provide something like single signed on, for example. And another thing you might want to do is uh, imagine uh, this application here. Uh, let's say it's uh, Flow Native Beach, a hosting uh, service, uh, wants to access something in your GitHub uh, repository. So, for example, uh, read some meta information or write some uh, deployment tokens or something like that. Now, what you wouldn't do is give... Um, this application here, your GitHub username and password. And this is what delegated authorization is for. So you know these kind of constant screens 
um, while you authorize a certain application to do something on your behalf with a different application. And that is basically uh, OAuth, which is also um, part of um, or the, the foundation of OpenID Connect. So th that is something you want to achieve. And the third thing is um, something uh, you, you might end up with a bigger application where you end up with microservices and so on, where you have the problem. So when I click this delete instance button here, um, this is not going to be processed directly by this application providing the user interface. There's a different service for that. So you might have microservices and so on. And now the question is, um, how do you transfer that information that this is a legitimate thing to do, deleting this instance? How do you, how do you communicate that to a microservice? How can that service be sure um, that this is really an authenticated user doing that? And this is also something OpenID Connect can help you with. So as I mentioned, this is an authentication framework and it's based on OAuth 2.0. So maybe let's talk about um, a few terms first before we go into uh, what OpenID Connect actually does and how you use it. So auth authentication, that means confirming uh, a user's or machine's identity. So this is all about um, being sure that this is actually the person or the machine you think you're talking to. And this is um, mostly what OpenID Connect does. And the, th the second uh, part would be uh, authorization. So let's illustrate that with these <laughs> conference passes here. So this conference pass um, authenticates me, more or less. So someone printed my name on it. And this, this would be the authentication part. But it doesn't tell um, which role I have at that conference, right? Um, and that is more about authorization. So giving some or verifying the permissions someone has or which role someone plays. So that would be this conference pass here. Um, this conference pass says I'm an artist, but it doesn't identify myself. So I could just pass this pass to someone else and then she would be an artist as well. So this is what uh, OAuth actually does. It authorizes um, some, some action, but it doesn't um, grant you uh, or, or tell you actually um, that it's a specific identity you can trust. Right, and then of course, um, in in real life, you will combine these concepts of authentication and authorization. Um, so, for example, this conference pass here has my name on it. It has even a photo for verifying my identity, but it also authorizes me because it says I'm a speaker. Actually, it even has something called a claim, and that is a fork. No, yeah, a fork and a spoon, which means I'm uh, authorized to get some lunch at that conference. Uh, oh, yeah, we need to talk about garbage collection later. Right. Um, so, identity provider. Identity provider is a service or a server actually um, providing you with uh, things like authentication. Um, for example, an identity provider in the case of OpenID Connect, would be a service which um, provides a login screen, for example, and authenticates the user. So the identity provider will take care of how to authenticate that user, um, asking for a password or a security token uh, or anything else. And usually within that identity provider, you also have an authorization server, which is the OAuth part, which um, uh, manages and, and tells you about the authorizations for a logged in user. Then you have, um, as a result, something transferred to you, uh, which is an identity token. 
that is basically um, some some data which contains useful information about the ent- uh, identity of the authenticated entity user, for example. That could be a username and that could be um, roles of that user. It could also be a profile like um, a first name, last name, email address or a URL pointing to a picture. And that identity token is uh, um, provided as a JSON web token. It looks like this. (laughs) Maybe you've seen something like that uh, before because it usually oh it always starts with e y why is that um actually that is because it's um base 64 encoded json which usually starts with a curly brace and that is then what you get there um if you take a closer look actually then you see that there are two dots in it and this is one of the forms to uh, how um identity tokens are provided and that is a header a payload and a signature Uh, you can also have encrypted uh, jwts but uh, i don't have them uh, right now here and they are just um, separated by dots so each of these parts is base64 encoded so if we decode that it looks like this and now it probably makes more sense Um, even though there's a few abbreviations uh, you might stumble over. So the header says something about uh, how this um, token actually has to be interpreted. So which algorithm is used for the signature, for example. And uh, the payload is the actual identity token. That is the, the message you want to receive there. So it has things like the issuer, uh, so who uh, produced these, this token. Uh, then the audience, um, it depends a bit on the service what, what that means, but uh, usually um, it means like, w- what is this uh, all about? Uh, where, where is this granted for? Then you have something like the expiry time and, um, and authentication time, a hash um, over the payload, uh, no, over the access token and and some other things, and then finally you have the signature, which depends on the algorithm. So in this case, it's binary code here for a RSA signature um, combined with a SHA two fifty six hash. All right, okay, you don't need to. <laughs> know all about that but um, just remember that JWT um, is what you get and that is your identity token and that is a very handy format because you can also use uh, store that for example um, uh, in, in uh, uh, JavaScript applications and so on. So we talked about scope a bit, uh, at least you've seen the scope. So that is a OAuth feature um, where you say, uh, I don't want to have access on everything. I try to only ask for a specific scope. For, a scope. for example, in this case, the application only asks for the email address and profile information from my GitHub um, account and not write access to or repositories or things like that. So that is what the scope is all about. And then there's a nice feature in OpenID Connect, which is um, the uh, OpenID Connect discovery uh, endpoint. So there are a lot of things you would have to configure in OpenID Connect, um, different URLs and uh, configuration parameters. For example, um, you need to find the public keys uh, in order to verify signatures. You need to find the authorization endpoint for OAuth and so on. And instead of um, putting that all into your configuration manually, there is a discovery endpoint usually provided by the identity provider. And there you get all the information in a nice table. So... I created a plugin, uh, yeah, a library for Flow, and of course that works with Neos as well. And that has a little 
CLI command YDC discover. Um, and then you can show all the discovery information <clears throat> provided by that endpoint. Right. So then finally, we have something important to mention that is the bearer access token. So um, imagine you want to authenticate and authorize. Uh, you have uh, seen that these, these different parts. Now the identity provider um, will do that for you and then give you not the username and password of the GitHub account, for example, but a, an, an access token which expires after some time um, and can be used only for the specific scope, right? And if you want to communicate, for example, with an API um, which is um, protected by OpenID Connect, um, then you usually send an authorization header with a bearer access token, and that is just... Um, some some JSON again with the access token um, provided by your identity provider. Okay, so there are two different uh, major two different um, ways of authentication with OpenID Connect, which I want to mention in this talk. Actually, um, this whole topic about OIDC is much larger than would fit into this specific specific talk because. I also want to show how to really integrate that uh, with your Flow or NEOS application. And even that I won't manage to show all. So uh, I need to restrict myself a bit. Um, let's start with authentication web users. So not machines, but people, right? Humans. They do have a browser, which is a nice thing, but also a problem because um, you cannot pass around um, secrets which are not intended for the user. Um, you can you need to do that behind the user's back, right? You cannot just um, uh, give that information to the browser and ask the browser to communicate with the identity provider. So um, that's why this this whole um, way of authentication is a bit more complicated than um, authentication between machines because you usually can trust them. And at this point, I only have demo for this part. Um, don't, I mean, you cannot ask me to slow down and I don't know if you can read the font in, in the last row, but <clears throat> that's how we have to do it right now. So um, at least you can, actually, you can pause the video <laughs> and go back if it's too confusing or if I do too many, um, have too many mistakes. But what I want to do is show you with the Neos demo website um, how this all can be uh, integrated. So let me just start a uh, virtual machine. Um, and then go into that. Right. Good. So this is a plain NEOS. Um, let me do that in a different different browser window. So this is just a plain NEOS demo website. I did not change anything there yet. So I can go to the login screen and log in and this and so on. Right. Um, except there is no user yet. So, um, well, well, it is the Neos demo site, but I already um, installed the OpenID Connect plugin. Is it here somewhere? Yeah. So it's the Flow Native OpenID Connect client. That's all I added here. Okay. So now I need some settings which I prepared somewhere so you need <clears throat> right so let's create some settings okay um and if that isn't obvious uh just a little bit of warning uh don't use this in production like exactly like i do so I, i'll take a few shortcuts and uh and you'll see that there might be a few things missing 
um, but in general, it does work. And this uh, plugin is actually used in production, of course. So take a look at this step by step, right? Um, so first thing is, uh, the first block is about OpenID, uh, OpenID Connect, um, the, the client that you can have multiple services. In this case, I define one service called NeosCon. So actually you can use different identity providers with endpoints and so on for different parts of your same application. Um, and all I configured here right now is the um, discovery URI. Let's see if that already works. Discover NeosCon. There it is. Um, is there? No. Okay. So this is, yeah, working because uh, you don't need any authentication for it. Uh, it will just ask that URL. Uh, for, for this information and gets it back as a JSON string. Now, um, I need some identity provider and one easy way to do that is to use a software as a service. So in this case, I use uh, something called Auth0, but um, I'm not affiliated with them, I'm just a customer. Um, but you can use something else as well. There are um, free provided identity providers, uh, OpenID Connect providers, a few of them at least. You can run your own server like Glue, for example, um, which is an open source implementation. But it's a quite a daunting task to, to get that not only running, but also keep that safe. So let's take a shortcut here and not um, worry about the identity provider, okay? Now, a few, a few more terms here, APIs and applications. It's sometimes a bit mind-boggling to, to remember. So um, which role am I right now? Like, am I the client or a server? Or am I, you know, a, a consumer of something? Or am I granting something? So in this case here, NEOS, um, what we want to achieve is that uh, NEOS... Um, when when you log in, that you are redirected to the identity provider, authenticate yourself, and get back to Neos, and then you're authenticated as a specific Neos user. So in this case, um, Neos is the API, yeah, um, because that is actually the backend which is protected. You protect an API. And um, it's also the application um, because the user interface is actually the application using um, the backend. So if that is a bit uh, confusing to you, uh, you'll see how that works in a second. So first thing we need to do is create a new API. And I just call that OIDC demo. And the identifier here doesn't say anything in specifics. You could just type any string, but it's a um, good convention to use the URL of the application um, providing the API. So let's create that. Okay, here we go. Um, now we have a few settings here. Um, which we'll get to um, in a second. And this API now needs to be used by applications. And we have automatically one um, application which was created. And that is uh, this OIDC demo application. And for the application, you have a client ID and a client secret. So. What does that mean, client ID and client secret? First of all, I, I'll copy that here from the, here to there because, I mean, this is client secret and client ID and, of course, and, and it's called like this here as well, so just put it in there. <laughs> um, so we'll go through the whole authentication process in a second, um, but in general... The client ID and client secret um, are long-lived credentials 
which need to be kept secret, which are for your application here, for this NEOS instance. Um, and this is they are needed to so that the application can authenticate itself um, against the identity provider um, and then get ultimately get some authorization code and access code in return. So this is the client idea and secret of this application here. Okay. Now let's do that a bit like uh, through trial and error and see what what happens uh, when we uh, run this. So the ne the the second part here is the Neos flow configuration. So let's take the security part here first. First of all. Um, you might know about authentication providers. So when I mean authentication provider, uh, when I say authentication provider, I mean Flow authentication provider. That is a concept in the security framework of Flow. So you have a username, password-based authentication provider. You have an API key-based uh, authentication provider. And the OpenID Connect client package here provides a new authentication provider called the OpenID Connect provider. You can have multiple authentication providers in your Flow application or in your Neos application, and they can be responsible for different parts of your application. So for example, one could be um, um, managing users for the front end and protect the front end um, or part of the front end of your website. and a different authentication provider could protect the backend. Now, in this case, we want to protect the backend with the OpenID Connect provider. And instead of creating a new one, I actually reuse the Neos Neos backend authentication provider configuration here because it contains request patterns and so on, which I don't want to repeat at this point. Okay. Um, but can perfectly be done that there are multiple authentication providers in parallel. It's just a bit more work and, and you need to be aware of the steps you're taking. So this is the configuration. Um, I override the label so we know it's OIDC. Um, I specify the class implementing this provider. So it's the OpenID Connect provider class here. And when someone authenticates with this provider, I can automatically grant certain NEOS user roles to that account. And this is what I do here. So whenever you authenticate with this provider here, I grant you the administrator role. Um, there are also different ways to configure this. I don't go into that in, into depth really, but what you could do, for example, is um, taking so-called claims um, from the identity token and use that for roles uh, in NEOS here. So that means your identity provider can control which roles you have in NEOS. Then, there's a token you need which must match the provider. So we have the ID Connect token. Don't mix that up with the identity token or some other token from OpenID Connect. This is a flow specific term, right? So this is just an implementation there. And then for the request patterns, uh, actually, I can leave that out. Then we have the entry point. Entry point is that. Um, implementation which Flow uses. If you are not authenticated and you won't need to authenticate, what should I do? Like redirect or try something else? And uh, this is an entry point. And the OpenID Connect entry point knows how to redirect you to the login page of the identity provider, for example. And there are a few options you can set. For example, when you log in, uh, when you authenticate yourself with that provider, what scopes do you want, right? These scopes here are not the GitHub uh, scopes, for example, but they are scopes defined at your identity provider, um, in this case, Auth0, right? Okay, so 
this is all the configuration we need. Um, there's something here about the JWT cookie, um, which we come to in a second. So what I expect now, what should happen is that when I uh, try to access a protected backend um, URL, that I get redirected to the identity provider because I have overridden the in, in built-in Neos backend provider and I want to uh, use this um, ID Connect provider so I should be redirected to the identity provider's login screen. Let's see what happens. Okay, so I end up at the identity provider here and there is an error and that is I did not specify the return URL in some uh, list here pro uh, in the auth OAuth0 configuration. Let's go to the APIs and the OIDC demo. Uh, no, not the API, the application, of course. Right. So the allowed callback URLs. Now, what happens there actually? Um, so th this this might be a good time to to look at what actually happens. So when I access one protected page in Neos then the authentication provider in NEOS will detect that there is no logged in user, there is no authenticated account, and will check the configuration and then find the web entry, no, the entry point defined by OIDC and redirects you to the identity provider. This redirect contains some additional parameters which tells the identity provider where to redirect back to when authentication was successful. So that is uh, the callback URL in this case. And you see um, what I pasted in here uh, is a URL uh, with the domain here, of course, and then OAuth2 OIDC NeosCon finish authorization. So why OAuth2? Um, this is OpenID Connect, isn't it? So OpenID Connect is using OAuth now to um, get hold of an uh, access token. And the way to do that, the so-called flow to do that, um, which you can see here in the advanced settings, is called the author authorization code grant. So that, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, there are different ways um, to authenticate and, for example, for users, uh, for humans using a browser for web applications, you have the authoriz uh, authorization code grant. And for machine-to-machine, -machine, uh, for example, um, you use client credentials. Okay. And for JavaScript applications, you might use implicit grants, but they are not as secure as the others. So how does authorization code grants actually work. So your application redirects to the identity provider and the identity provider authenticates the user and then redirects back to your application. So far, so good. But uh, while redirecting to your application, in the URL, there is not the final access token, which you can later use um, for authentication uh, in, in your with your web service and so on, but there is one step in between, and that is the identity provider puts an authorization code into the URL pointing back to your application, which can be uh, exchanged to a um, access token. But you need the client ID and client credential, um, client secret in order to do that exchange. So this is one extra step to make it more secure. And this is what you see here in the callback URL. So it points to uh, OAuth0 um, 
OAuth2 and Finnish authorization, which is basically just uh, a controller action provided by uh, an OAuth plugin in Flow. Okay, so when that is called um, in Flow, behind the scenes, not through the browser, but directly through a call request um, from the application on the server side and to the identity provider, that authorization code is used and uh, changed into an access code. And that access code is then stored um, locally and then, for example, sent to the browser as part of a, to uh, a cookie. Okay, And then the user interface, for example, the JavaScript application can use that um, access token to authenticate directly with your um, Neos application. So the backend, for example. That's a lot of theory. Let's see if that works when I save it, actually. So let's try again. And... Right. So you see here um, in the URL, there's also some state variable mentioned, and that is kind of like a reference code which can be uh, which is used by Flow to uh, track back um, what kind, uh, which uh, authentication uh, this was. So when when the URL um, when the request comes back in to finish authorization. Um, it can look up uh, for which user that was originally intended and so on. Okay, so let's sign up here with a completely new user. Let's give it a fancy password, neoscon, neoscon, one, two, three. So now I'm redirected back and I still end up in the login screen. And that is because um, the um, user, the newly generated user from, provided by the identity provider does not exist in the NEOS application, right? Uh, you might implement something which uh, like, like on the fly creates that user, but this is not the case yet because this plugin is not directly tailored for NEOS yet. To be honest, so it's it's just a more, more general purpose OIDC implementation for Flow. So let's take a look at here at the users management. You see, um, there's a new user which has been created. Let's go to the details, and here you see the user ID. Um, this user ID is communicated to Neos through the identity token. And we need to create a user with that username for this to work. The password can be anything because it's not used, but be careful without further configuration. Um, so if, if I just type password here, um, imagine the OIDC authentication would not work then you would be able to log in with that username and this simple password using the regular username password provider. So uh, you need a different way to, to solve this. Okay, so that user exists now. And now try, let's try again. I just call this protected URL here. Get redirected to the identity pro provider. and then. I'm logged in, okay? So let's try again. Um, I closed that window, which was a private window here. Try again, NEAS, I get, oh, I have a different private window open again. Now I am redirected to here, log in, uh, NEAS, con, NEAS, con, one, two, three. Now I'm logged in to Neos. Now let's try something else. Um, 
So let's say I sign up with GitHub. Use some security key here. So and now you have the uh, OAuth part here, which grants permissions for a specific scope requested. Let's do that. So now I'm here again because that new user does not exist. Because in this case, um, there was a second user created. There are ways to configure that so users are merged automatically with the same uh, email address but in this case uh, we have a separate user which does not exist in NEOS and let's take that user ID and create a an user as well and Try again. Log sign in with GitHub. Fun funnily, you need to do that twice. <laughs> and then you're logged in as Robert Octocat. Okay, I guess um, that's already like what I could show in this talk here. Um, there's much more to tell about authentication um, for applications, uh, which is a bit simpler, but um, requires different kinds of code on, on the server side. And um, what I didn't cover as well was how you actually use the identity token programmatically, how you automatically assign roles from the identity token and much more. But I hope um, you get got some overview of what OpenID actually can do and how actually if you leave all the talking out, uh, how easy it can be uh, configured um, also for an EOS backend. So um, if you have any feedback or actually it would be really nice if anyone would just write me an email or reach me on Twitter so I know someone actually watched this talk because I don't know if anyone does. <laughs> um, any feedback or questions are welcome uh, or if I can help you with OpenID Connect as well. So I hope you enjoyed it and now enjoy the other talks in this conference. Hi. <laughs> um, we have him here. The glitter throwing, the confetti throwing. Robert Lemke is here to answer all of our questions. Ah, and there is his yeah, award. And I, You're in matching in that colors. Short time, I could even switch my dress here. You changed See, to match again. me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Robert, I see your not so subtly placed award. It makes <laughs> no, its way. It's, there's no award. It's what just a award? Logo. Good to see you. Oh, but I've prepared a few questions, mostly from the chat. I have uh, sorted them in um, rising level of difficulty. <clears throat> first question. First, what's the name of your headset? <laughs> <laughs> Günther. <laughs> <laughs> we saw your answer on Slack and we really liked it. So uh, thank you to Günther too for providing excellent sound quality. <laughs> yeah. Um, next, we have another question from the chat where I think Shimon from yesterday wanted to know if you've used um, external identity, uh, identity providers like Identity Server from WSO2 before. Yeah. So there are, I mean, uh, different identity providers. So uh, some which allow you to manage your own users, for example. Um, imagine you have a company and uh, want to set up a user for everyone there. Well, then you need your own identity provider or some service which provides that to you. Um, and there are different open source projects, for example, uh, yeah, providing such a software which you can install and run, like Glue, for example. Um, and then there are other identity providers which you might know, like GitHub uh, or Google or Facebook or whatever. 
um, which you can also use um, as as a identity provider, um, but then you're not able to manage your own users. So while I'm strictly a front-end kind of developer, I have heard of GitHub before, thank you. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, and then there's a question that um, uh, that has been boggling us all. Why does it have to be so difficult? I saw Renz in the big blue button blurby bur Burton chat um, ask, or commenting that uh, it's like the next mail server. Just remind yourself not to do it again. Why, yeah. why does it have to be so difficult? And maybe in, as a second add-on question, is there a way or do you see in the future a way of making it easier? Because really all I want is my users to be able to sign in. Yeah, so there are still ways, uh, easy ways to do authentication, uh, of course. And so the, the old mechanisms which existed for many years uh, still make sense. For example, if you just uh, have an EOS uh, installation and want users to be able to uh, to to log in, you don't need such a thing. But um, if you want to centralize user management, for example, in a company and use different services with it, um, like so, you can log in into Neos, but also log into your ticket system and so on. Or if you want to improve security of microservices, uh, that was one thing I, I explained in the talk where. You would say, okay, I'm logged in into some management user interface and click a button. And then I need to pass on that command to some microservice and that might put it to some other microservice. And how can that last microservice know that uh, this is a legitimate thing you, you want to do? And this is where you need these kinds of mechanisms. And Using them is already complex, but not impossible. But setting up the server side of it, like the identity provider, is another task, and yeah, which I avoid. <laughs> and will it be easier one day, maybe? No, I think it will be <laughs> even more complex. So, because you you might use as a front ender uh, that uh, there there might be something like a session cookie, right? But that's old-fashioned. I, I also had to learn, for example, you, you, um, you cannot just put that JWT in a, in a cookie. I mean, you can, but that is not uh, considered to be secure enough. Uh, you want to use service workers for that. And We've heard then plenty talk about with those. Dimitri about <laughs> what a hassle that is. Okay, and I just, uh, the, the, the headquarters are giving me another question straight from Slack. Um, Niklas Droste wants to know if it's possible to register the user on first login. Yes, absolutely. Um, so uh, you, you can configure, and depending on your identity provider, you can do that like behind the scenes. And um, uh, that, that sign up, for example, you might require someone to verify her email address before you actually can do something important. But uh, you can also just allow people to um, start use, or looking around in your user interface. And then only when you do something important, then you uh, look up uh, if that user has, been, has verified her email address or not. Things like that, yeah. Very cool. One last very important question. How do you feel about biodegradable glitter thrown at you yeah, at the next I, possible... I haven't seen such a thing, but glitter uh, is made through, from some minerals, or which is called glitter, I think. So it's, it's uh, like natural already. <laughs> so, um, but it's also very expen expensive. I think you put it into lipsticks and so Glitter. Or lipstick, I wouldn't know. <laughs> yeah, <me either. laughs> not today. But okay. I think that was an approval for the next Neos conference. Yeah, definitely. There will definitely yeah. be. I mean, now the whole community knows to bring. And the good thing <laughs> about being up there is that it's quite hot, um, especially back then when there were no LED lights. <laughs> you can imagine. Yeah, I'm really glad that these don't warm me up in addition to blinding me. <laughs> 
Toby, do you have another question? Uh, not for Robert at this point, no. Uh, thank you very much, Robert, for taking the time again uh, and yep. answering our questions. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your talk today. And yeah, talk to you soon. Bye-bye, Robert. Bye. Bye.